Petty Officer Williams woke to the sound of her alarm in the morning of November 6, 2019. Williams, the mother to a five-year-old, should have woken to the soft noises of her child stirring in the next room. Perhaps she would have normally tripped over an errant t-shirt or even a dreaded Lego piece as she began to don her uniform and prepare for work. Instead of a debate over whether they were having fruit and yogurt or bacon and eggs, Williams was met with silence as she stepped into her boots and adjusted her cover. She prepared like it was any other day. Then she staged a phone call to the police to report her child missing. This is Conduct Unbecoming. I'm Erin, and I'm your host. A quick heads up before we get too far down this path. This episode involves discussion of the death of a young child and is a bit reminiscent of the Kaylee Anthony death. If that means that this case is not for you, all good. Catch me next time. On Wednesday, November 6, 2019, Brianna Williams called 911 to report Taylor, her five-year-old daughter, was missing. She said she'd last seen her at around midnight the night before, and that when she awoke, she discovered the back door was unlocked and that Taylor was missing. Williams was no longer with Taylor's father. He didn't live in Jacksonville. He didn't even live in the state of Florida. And no one seemed worried that he'd snuck in in the middle of the night and absconded with the young girl. When investigators responded to the address Williams provided, at first they couldn't actually find her. She'd given them an incorrect address. So they walked the neighborhood trying to find the distraught mother that called about her missing child. When Williams emerged from her house and they finally made contact with her, investigators observed that her distress seemed forced. Prior to the police arriving at her home, Williams took the time to get dressed for work. And I really struggle with this detail because I don't understand if she thought she would just head into the office after passing this matter off to the Jacksonville police. Williams walked responding investigators through her house as she explained her morning so far. She woke in her bedroom, she went about starting her day, and then she found the back door unlocked and perhaps open, though articles vary on this particular detail. During that walkthrough, investigators observed guns, plural, on her bed, but didn't see anything other than a small bed that might indicate a child also lived there. There were no toys or children's clothes lying around, nothing of the usual detritus that having a young child in the house comes with. Investigators found the complete lack of anything child-related to be odd. With the walkthrough of the house complete, Williams accompanied investigators to the Jacksonville police station to provide any leads she could to try and help find Taylor. Williams told investigators of her family's rhythm, explaining that Taylor recently spent time with her maternal grandmother, Williams's mother. But the family reported that Williams had become more difficult to get hold of recently, Calls and texts weren't answered, or responses came late and full of excuses. Williams' sister reported that she hadn't actually seen Taylor in more than two years, since the little girl was three years old. But Williams' mother said she had much more recent contact with Taylor, and recalled last seeing her nearly ten months earlier, in January 2018. Police followed up on the breadcrumbs Williams fed them. She'd first reported that Taylor regularly attended daycare on base. But the Child Development Center aboard Naval Air Station Jacksonville reported that Taylor had not attended daycare there since April 29, 2019. 
When investigators confronted Williams with the daycare's record of Taylor's attendance, she pivoted and explained that she hired a babysitter off Craigslist to care for Taylor. Williams had been on her phone for a portion of the interview, texting and answering phone calls. And while this seems to have been offered to show her disinterest in the case, I don't think it's unreasonable that a single mother would need to respond to concerned family and friends following the report that her child was missing. So it wouldn't be fair to jump to conclusions based off that detail alone. The police asked Williams to put her phone down and talk with them. They needed her answers if they wanted to find Taylor. Approximately one hour after the interview began at the police station, Williams refused to participate any longer. She spent the next ten hours largely alone in the interview room. Then, as night fell in Florida, Williams went home. One of her colleagues picked her up from the interview in order to drive her home and observed that she didn't cry or say she wanted to look for Taylor. The report of a missing little girl sparked the Jacksonville community to action, and searches began in earnest. The police asked Jacksonville residents to get in touch if they'd seen Williams and Taylor together in the preceding six months. More than 300 officers and other personnel assisted in the search. They left no stone unturned and used every resource at their disposal, including canine searchers, horse-mounted searchers, and dive teams. As day broke on Thursday, November 7th, police officers and searchers grabbed their gear and prepared to renew the search for this missing little girl. Williams, on the other hand, woke, dressed, and returned to work. Finding no luck in the area closest to Williams's home, the search for Taylor expanded to Alabama and Georgia on November 10th. This made a lot of sense because Williams grew up fairly nearby in Demopolis, Alabama, and her family still lived in the area, the town where she was named homecoming queen and graduated at the top of her class. On Monday, November 11th, the sheriff's office provided an update to a public curious about the missing girl, and revealed that Williams stopped participating shortly after reporting Taylor missing. Williams said that she was just over their questioning. She said she just wanted her baby home, and that their questioning had gone too far. At the press conference on the 11th, the sheriff announced that Williams was considered a person of interest. The following day, search teams discovered the decomposing remains of a child in a crudely dug grave near Linden and Demopolis, Alabama. Though police did not identify the remains immediately, Williams knew that this discovery would close this terrible chapter of her life. The then 27-year-old couldn't bear what would come next and attempted to die by suicide by ingesting laundry detergent. Emergency medical personnel raced Williams to the hospital by helicopter. She survived her attempt and recovered in a medically induced coma. When Williams ingested that laundry detergent, police were already on their way to arrest her. They were armed with a search warrant detailing incidents of child neglect and a general lack of supervision. Given her medical status, she was booked into jail in absentia. Within a week, Williams recovered sufficiently to move to the Duval County Jail. She was held on a million-dollar bond, an amount a petty officer certainly wouldn't have on hand. The following week, on Monday, November 25th, the police announced that the remains discovered in Alabama were Taylor's. They didn't announce a cause of death yet, but they did formally cancel the Amber Alert issued when Williams reported her missing. Then came the hard work, piecing together the details of Taylor's short life and untimely death. 
In early 2019, Williams and Taylor lived in an apartment together. Later in the year, Williams moved to a new residence. The source information made it sound like Williams' family genuinely believed that the new place would be a more cost-effective living situation than the apartment. Though Williams would have to pay double rent, that is rent on the apartment and rent on the house, until the lease on her apartment was up. This doesn't make any sense to me, because I have to believe that it's less expensive to break a lease than it is to continue to pay rent on an unused space until the lease contract expires. But it's possible that I'm looking at this detail with an overly critical eye, because of what the police discovered in the apartment. A forensic team found a closet in the apartment that reeked of feces and decomposition. There were blood stains on the carpet and walls. Taylor's blood. Neighbors at that apartment complex described their interactions with Taylor and Williams. They said that Taylor was often wandering around the complex unattended. One of their neighbors was particularly accustomed to seeing Taylor around the complex. He knew that she often played unattended, but also that when she was regularly attending daycare, he would see Williams and Taylor come home together at the end of the day. He said the last time he saw Taylor playing outside on her own was April 17, 2019. In mid-May, he saw Taylor for the last time, waving at him from inside the sliding door. After not seeing Taylor for a while, he asked Williams how she was doing. Williams explained that Taylor was spending the summer in Alabama with her grandparents. Williams didn't stop living her life in those final months of Taylor's life. Although I haven't seen any reports of anybody seeing Taylor alive after mid-May 2019, investigators believe she was alive for at least three and a half more months. When Williams left the apartment, it's believed that she left Taylor in that storage closet, locked from the outside. Investigators believed that she would punch holes in soup cans and leave them to feed Taylor. There wasn't much evidence to suggest that Williams did anything more than that to keep Taylor fed. Perhaps it wasn't unusual that there was no food in the semi-abandoned apartment, but a review of Williams's spending revealed no significant purchase of groceries in the months before Taylor's death. The final photos of Taylor revealed that she was small and apparently losing weight. Taylor wasted away in Jacksonville, and her remains showed evidence of malnutrition. Investigators believed that, in all likelihood, Taylor starved to death between April and August 2019, after Williams pulled her from daycare and began to leave her alone in the storage closet. Her extended family was eager to see her, to connect with her, to be the village for Williams as she raised her child. Williams was close enough to visit home and to ask for help. But when she finally loaded Taylor into her car and made the seven-hour drive, she didn't put her only child in an age-appropriate booster seat. She put Taylor's lifeless body into a trash bag, loaded her into her trunk, and drove just outside her hometown to bury her. Cell phone records placed Williams in the part of rural Alabama where Taylor's body was found. Later, Williams explained that one day she couldn't find Taylor, and that she discovered her cold body in that storage closet. She claimed she didn't know what to do, but that she wanted to bury Taylor near her grandfather. I wondered about what motivated Williams to file a missing persons report for Taylor in early November. What little sense I could make of it revolved around the holidays. 
I think it's pretty reasonable not to travel the seven hours from Jacksonville to Demopolis, Alabama for a midweek Halloween. I don't think anyone would question Williams and Taylor staying home to trick-or-treat. But with Thanksgiving approaching and Christmas just behind, I think the clock was really ticking. Soon, Williams would need to explain why she wasn't coming home, and why no one could come down and visit them. Initially, Florida charged Williams only with lying to police, tampering with evidence, and child abuse. They didn't charge Williams with murder. Williams pled not guilty to each of those charges. And it's kind of unclear what changed, specifically what additional evidence led to murder charges. Perhaps it was enough that they discovered that Williams suffered from an eating disorder and that Taylor's father previously complained that Taylor wasn't being properly fed. Facing additional charges, Williams elected to plead guilty to second-degree murder. For sentencing, the prosecution argued that Williams should spend life in prison. Williams argued that the statutory minimum of 20 and one-half years was the appropriate sentence. The judge heard sentencing evidence for three days, including testimony from a psychologist that painted Williams as anxious, depressed, and exhibiting symptoms of schizophrenia and mood disorders. From what I gather, all of the psychologist's observations were made after the fact, after Taylor died, after Williams drove to Alabama and dug her a grave, after Williams was already arrested. In our last episode, the Abdullah case, the intermediate appellate court had to grapple with whether Abdullah made any showing of a particularized anxiety while waiting for the results of his appeal. And I guess that's still rattling around in my noggin for this case. I think most people staring down the barrel at a life sentence after starving a child to death would exhibit signs of anxiety and depression, and neither really does much to explain why Taylor died. The source materials don't describe whether Williams was actually diagnosed with schizophrenia or a mood disorder, so I'm not going to armchair psychology and explanation. Williams was reportedly too nervous to read her sentencing statement, and someone from the public defender's office read it for her. In part, the statement read, I knew what I did was wrong. I failed as a mother, a protector, and as a decent human being. I didn't immediately call the police, and when I finally called, I lied and lied some more. I didn't take any timely opportunity to right my wrongs. I apologize to everyone affected by this tragedy. I'm tormented and punished every day since losing my baby. I've looked at this statement from a few different angles, and I'm really struggling with it. Read in the most compassionate lens, it seems like a mother who couldn't help what happened because of her own mental health issues, and who's struggling to cope with the loss of a child. But on my less compassionate read, I find someone who always had the power to save Taylor, but doesn't really acknowledge her role. She didn't lose her baby. She didn't lose Taylor. She neglected Taylor and allowed her to starve to death. Perhaps the judge felt similarly. He sentenced Williams to life imprisonment. It does occur to me that the sentence of life in prison very closely mirrors the conditions Williams kept Taylor in for the final months of her short life, confined against her will, dependent fully on those who mind her. A life sentence for a life stolen. (laughs) 
There isn't much of a legal curiosity for you today, legal beagles. That's because the opinion issued by the Florida court weighs in at just one word. Affirmed. This was novel to me because I'm accustomed to California state law, where our state constitution requires courts to provide written reasons for their decisions on appeal. Summary affirmance, like the summary affirmance in Williams's case, is permissible in Florida. Frankly, there is so little ink spilled on her appeal that it's not clear what sort of argument she actually made, what sort of error she may have alleged that the trial court made. From what I gather, there is an automatic appeal in Florida for some criminal cases. But those automatic appeals are limited to capital cases, death penalty cases. And those go straight to the Florida Supreme Court. That makes sense because if the state is going to deprive someone of their life, they need to be certain there weren't errors in the administration of justice. But this wasn't a death penalty case, and the opinion wasn't issued by the Florida Supreme Court. Given that Williams accepted a plea, I would assume that any allegations she made of error were tied to the sentencing phase. Either that the judge considered evidence she didn't believe he should have, or that the sentence was inappropriate given the crime at the heart of the case. But the Intermediate Appellate Court unanimously affirmed the sentence in April of last year, so any error or violation that she alleged was not an actual error or legal violation. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's episode, please share it. I invite you to submit case suggestion and feedback to conductunbecomingpod at gmail.com or on conductunbecomingpod.com. Join me next time when we explore a conviction more than 20 years in the making. Until then, take care. Conduct and Becoming is a podcast where I get to talk about interesting crimes and cases that involve U.S. military service members. I research, write, and produce the podcast myself. The opinions expressed are my own, and perhaps it's obvious. Conduct and Becoming is not approved, authorized, or endorsed by the Department of Defense.